Hello everyone. What we're dealing with right now when it comes to the war in Ukraine is a race for time. Thanks to the dilly-dallying by the U.S. House of Representatives, um, Ukraine is basically forced to what is known as shorten the front line. It means basically retreating. If any of you want to be gleeful about it, just please just block my channel and, you know, don't watch my content because I have no patience for you right now. This means lost lives. This means murdered civilians. This means a lot of truly terrible things for a lot of people, including my parents. So just don't. There's been another advance by the Russian troops um, in the uh, Donetsk Luhansk region. We all know this is this has been a terribly hot spot for a long time now, actually going back ten years. So, as much as possible, Ukrainians are trying to hold on tooth and nail, but like I said, it it is a race for time. So hopefully. We'll see some progress in this area soon. And, you know, one of the concerns is that the channels, the corridors um, used to transfer the weapons to Ukraine, of course, are targeted. And so that remains to be one of the biggest issues. So I'm sure there will be more to come on the subject. Meanwhile... The sooner the better. Now, here's um, an encouraging site. Uh, we've had a visit by um, Secretary General of the Transatlantic Military Alliance. So, as I mentioned before, uh, it's kind of amazing how uh, foreign dignitaries are affected when they actually have a chance to go and see for themselves what is happening in Ukraine. So I'm glad this dude went and did exactly that. He went and saw for himself. And so that's a good sign in addition to the fact that um, any new alliance uh, that could potentially join Ukrainians in their fight against Russians is good. And here is something interesting. So initially, um, of course, Russians have been saying, oh, you know, we started the war in Ukraine because we were threatened by NATO, we were threatened by EU, etc., etc. But at the time, as everybody knows, there was nothing going on. I, I told the story many times, the um, Events in October of 2013 began with Ukraine's merely wanting to expand their trade deals with the European Union. So once again, there was no talk at the time of Ukraine joining NATO. There was nothing talking about the EU, etc., etc. And that was when Russia began its campaign of greater than usual interference with the affairs in Ukraine. So now what they have achieved, in fact, with this war is directly the opposite. EU had seen what happened and said, you know what? We are going to need more members. We are going to need uh, more think tanks. We are going to have longer, more extensive conversation about our defenses. That will need to happen. Because Russia's over there and shit's not looking so good. Uh, same with NATO. I'm sure the same conversations are happening uh, among the NATO members. So, in effect, by invading Ukraine, Russia had achieved exactly the very thing that they were complaining about to begin with. 
that is ironic. That's like so ironic, it's it's palpable. Now, this is a Newsweek, again, Newsweek being largely and kind of a, more of an entertainment source of news. I don't use it often, but I did find this interesting. I'd like to see uh, more information about this. Um, in other sources. Basically, it's a testimony of a, a Russian soldier who is warning his uh, fellow Russians not to join the army and resist to their, their absolute best going to the Ukrainian front. And this reminds me of the stories that we have read about German soldiers toward the end of World War II. Um, because that was like the worst thing that could happen to you once you came of age. Uh, once uh, you became eligible for army conscription, you know, you were basically screwed. So this is very, very similar. And the parallels have been drawn between World War II and what is happening in Ukraine, starting with the annexation of uh, Crimea, uh, very much um, similar to Germany's invasion of Sudetenland and how at the time the rest of the world decided to let them uh, because they thought that would keep the peace. And of course, we all know how that turned out. So this piece, again, fits right in with that narrative. And honestly, uh, if his fellow Russians would listen to this guy, this would be really priceless. And of course, there is this. We already know that uh, Russia violated multiple conventions that exist around the world, uh, including convention pertaining to the rules of war, specifically the torture of prisoners. We already know they tortured civilians. There is plenty of evidence of that. Uh, I'm sure you have heard the names Bucha and Derping many times, but there are others like Bucha and Derping uh, that haven't gotten quite the same level of coverage. But, you know, they're there. The torture existed. And so this is just, again, just one more of the many crimes committed by Russians on Ukrainian territory. And, of course, my question to the world community, to the international community, is this. Once again, what are you going to do about it? You know, this has happened. Ukraine has been stripped of an entire generation this includes children, this includes um, young people, this includes artists, writers, everybody who was either killed or imprisoned, permanently scarred in the course of this war. Are you still going to sit there and tell Ukraine that it's somehow not waging the war correctly from your standpoint? Are you still going to sit and tell Ukrainians that this is not genocide, even though what is happening matches your very own definition of genocide? So lots of questions there. Um, I guess we'll see how how things go. As of right now, all eyes are on the foreign aid, on the um, help coming in, and um, I'm sure there will be more to come as more atrocities mm -hmm. are uncovered. Mm -hmm.